Thanks, Victoria. Thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, I'm surprised you're all here. <laughs> um, uh, apologies for, for looking through my glasses, uh, peering, I might say. Uh, I've just broken my, my other glasses, uh, so I'm having to use my reading glasses instead. But I can see you all. Don't worry. Um, the, the, my, my interest in, um, in Percy Ludgate came in two different ways. Uh, one was uh, because I was an academic computer scientist and uh, principally involved in computer architecture, which is on the hardware side of computing. And Percy Ludgate was uh, the second person to actually propose uh, computer hardware uh, that would actually do everything that a modern day computer would do, although very slowly. And the second reason is uh, that I got involved was because from something like 2011 or so, I've been a curator of our computer science collection, which is quite, quite uh, magnificent. And uh, in within that, we have all the uh, the literature and uh, records, etc., that relate to Percy Ludgate. And it's uh, it's during the cataloging of all of that that I uh, thought that perhaps we should look further into. Uh, Percy Ludgate and see if we could discover more because so little was known. Um, so we're talking about about Percy Ludgate. Uh, the principal thing is why why is he important? Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the main reason he's important is he was the second person in history uh, to design a general-purpose computer, uh, and that term has a very special meaning in in computer science, and this is all the computer science you'll get. <laughs> um, uh, it means that it's an analytical uh, machine, uh, and uh, such a thing, and vice versa, and in such a thing, in theory, can solve all uh, solvable problems. Not all problems are solvable. Uh, a lot of people don't appreciate that. Uh, so, so these analytical machines are what is termed Turing complete, uh, which is a term that was invented uh, to reflect Alan Turing's contribution to the theory of all of this. Um, and that's the end of the computer science. Uh, the rest of this will be history. Um, there were only two mechanical designs uh, for analytical engines uh, proposed uh, before the electronic computer era. Uh, one was uh, by Charles Babbage way back in 1843 and the second in 1909 by, uh, by Percy Ludgate. And his was uh, sharply different from, uh, from uh, Babbage's. And subsequently, in uh, 1914 to 20, uh, some designs for uh, electrically based uh, mechanical uh, uh, analytical machines started, uh, as they call it, electromechanical, uh, started to be developed. Uh, but very few of them. And then from 1937, uh, electronic uh, designs began to evolve. Another reason he was important was he was Irish. Um, so from uh, 1883 all the way to 1922, he was born and he lived and he died in Ireland. Uh, and uh, he worked in Dublin. He published in the scientific proceedings of the Royal Dublin Society. And in 1991, the Computer Science Department in Trinity College established a Ludgate Prize uh, for uh, the best uh, final year project uh, presented each year. Um, and that, that continues. Uh, and then on top of that, he was born here in Skibreen. Uh, so in 2016, the Ludgate Hub was opened uh, in Skibreen in his honor. There's two central mysteries about, uh, about Percy Ludgate. One has to do with his life, and the other has to do with his machinery. Um, and he was young and single uh, and only aged 39 when he died in 1922. Uh, and by 1987, there were no other descendants of his family, of his immediate uh, relatives. Uh, so records are very scant. Uh, and Professor Randall from Newcastle University, who is a noted expert on uh, Percy Ludgate, uh, has said that when he was dealing with the archivists in Ireland, an archivist said, but by all normal criteria, Percy Ludgate never existed. Um, and, and yet he did exist, and he had a, a, a large number of relatives and acquaintances. Um, and the first objective is to find them and to find any related documents, photos, memories uh, that, they, that they may have. Uh, uh, we have not been able to, um, to, to contact uh, 
close relatives of uh, Percy Ludgate, and the whole GDPR security um, privacy environment now precludes us from being able to do that uh, easily. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that later. Then the second mystery is to do with this is machine. Uh, in his 1909 paper, he says that uh, it's not possible in such a short paper, and remember it was five to six pages long, so it wasn't that short, um, to, to give any detail as to the mechanism, and therefore he confined himself to just the superficial description and touched only on the principal points of interest. And so uh, details of his machine are scant as well. Um, uh, but, but in 1909, he said that many drawings uh, of the machine had been prepared by himself. And five years later, in 1914, he said that complete descriptive uh, uh, drawings uh, existed, as well as uh, a description uh, in manuscript form. Uh, so clearly, he put a lot of work into this. A machine of the complexity that he, he designed would take a oh, minimum of 50 diagrams, uh, quite possibly uh, a couple of hundred. Uh, so somewhere out there, maybe these uh, diagrams exist. And the ultimate um, objective is to, is to find those diagrams. And in fact, that's what kicked us off in the first place. Uh, uh, the very small probability they will still exist, uh, but such things have been known to happen. Um, and, and I point you, if you want to have a real good example of, of uh, minimal probability of succeeding in what you want to find, look up Breaker Morant uh, in Wikipedia. <laughs> So Babbage was the first person to develop an analytical engine, and it's, it's instructive to look at what he did. Um, sorry. Oh, this is playing games. So this is Charles Babbage uh, from about uh, 10 years before he died. Uh, get in? Why? That's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to fall off. Um, so this is, this is actually uh, a picture taken from his obituary. Uh, oops, I don't think I'm connecting very well here. Babbage de designed his analytical engine uh, in two parts. The first was a mill, shown here. And you can see it's built like a layer cake, like a sponge cake, if you like. Um, and each layer represents one digit of a number and Babbage designed for 50 digit numbers. So there are 50 layers stacked one above the other here. Uh, and inside, there is a big circular ring gear that, uh, that engages with all these little gears around the outside that do the calculation for him. Uh, and that ring gear is also replicated per digit. So there are 50 of these eight foot diameter ring gears in inside this. Um, and then the second part of his machine is, is uh, storage. And you can see it's layered as well. And, and each column represents a number. Uh, and there are 50, 50 uh, little gears uh, per number, one per digit. And the rotation, you know, if a, if a gear is three cogs around, uh, then it's representing the, or storing the number three. If it's seven cogs around, it's storing the number seven. So a very simple uh, idea. He designed for, yes, very good, yeah. He designed to store uh, a thousand numbers. So this machine goes, the storage part of it goes a long way back. In fact, for his thousand numbers, it would be 500 meters in length. Uh, and 500 meters is twice the length of uh, Westminster Cathedral. Uh, so it was big. Um, and the width of it wasn't as wide as Westminster Cathedral, but in, in acreage, I suppose, if you want to talk in farming terms, um, it, it, uh, it has roughly the same uh, footprint as uh, Westminster, as the, the central nave of Westminster Cathedral. Um, so it was entirely mechanical. It required precision engineering. Uh, it was just about... Uh, uh, able to be constructed with the technology of the time, and it was very big. Um, whoops. No, no. There we go. Uh, 
nonetheless, it was very novel uh, at the time. Uh, nobody had done anything like it before. He was the very first to propose the concept of an analytic analytical engine. Uh, and what he did was he processed uh, things in the mill, he stored things in the storage. In the mill, everything that was processed was processed with addition. So if he, if he wished to multiply two times three, he added two three times. Uh, and similarly, if you wanted to divide six by three, he, he, he subtracted three uh, until he got to zero. And, the, and that would have happened twice, so the result would have been two. Uh, the mill and the storage were, as I've said, uh, based on clockwork and cogs and gears. And this is actually a technology that goes back to, uh, to Leibniz in, in 1671. Whereas his programming and his input and output, uh, printing, keyboards, things like that, uh, were via uh, punch cards. And that's, that's a technology that goes back to 1801 when uh, Jacquard invented the first weaving looms uh, in, in Lyon. Oops, this isn't working very well. Uh, there we go, it's all right. Anyway, it was never built, uh, but what he did do is he left uh, really extensive drawings. Uh, as I said, Ludgate's machine would have involved several, you know, a couple of hundred drawings, perhaps Babbage's required even more. There, there are, I don't know, maybe a thousand drawings uh, of it. And these are now being put into modern engineering software and the intention is to be able to at least simulate the operation of it in a computer, but, but uh, if possible to be able to build it with, uh, with um, 3D uh, printing uh, machines. So perhaps it will yet be built. Whoops, come on. I think I might be pressing it on the side rather than the center. So let's talk about Ludgate's analytical machine. Whoops. This is Percy Ludgate, again, uh, a short number of years before he died, uh, maybe five years beforehand. He would have been about 35 uh, at this point. Again, like Babbage, he uh, built, he started off his machine with a mill which did addition in the same way as, as Babbage's uh, did. Uh, but then, as well as that, he introduced a, a brand new concept, and what he called an index to do multiplies. And he did this based on logarithms. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and so his, the core of this machine uh, did not do just additions. It did what's called mul multiply accumulation. Multiply followed by an add. If there's something in the, in, in, you know, if there's a, a result there beforehand, you can multiply two numbers and then add the, re, uh, the result of the multiplication to whatever the previous result was. Uh, in other words, you can accumulate results that way. And this is something that's inside all main signal processes, uh, started off being used in radar systems, but now in your mobile phones for Siri and your Apple uh, I, uh, iPhones, for instance, they have multiply accumulate uh, 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 hardware in them. It's an essential part of things like that. Whoops. And all of this was, uh, was performed under program control. Maybe if I come over, over here, maybe it'll work a little better. Yes. But I'm in the way. Allow me to get down here. He, he also added uh, uh, some cylindri cylindrical mechanisms to do, to do division and, and logarithms, again under program control. But his pièce de résistance was, um, was his storage system, which was based around two uh, cylindrical um, Concentric cylinders, if you wish to put it that way, and uh, these held numbers in, in shuttles. Uh, and you can see up the top there, there are rods sticking out from these shuttles. Um, so in a shuttle, the sh shuttle would represent or hold one, still one number, and in a shuttle there would be 21 rods, one for the sign of the number, so plus or minus, and the other 20, one rod per digit of, of the number. And they would protrude 
from the shuttle between 1 and 10 units. So to represent uh, a digit 7, then that rod would be protruding 7 units out from the shuttle. Um, and in order to, uh, to, to actually access uh, or to use um, uh, numbers, all you had to do was rotate the, the shuttle to the point where uh, it aligned with the index at the bottom there. So the way a calculation would have been done would be, for instance, x times y. You'd take, uh, say, the x would be in the outer, uh, the, the, out, the outer shuttle and the y would be on the inner shuttle. You would rotate those around to where they were aligned with those, t uh, those two, two red, uh, what, they, what he called races. And, and those shuttles that would then be brought uh, forward to engage with the index. Uh, and then the calculation would proceed. You'd do a multiply followed by uh, an accumulate. And then the result would be fed back into a new shuttle and stored somewhere else in, in uh, one of those two, uh, two cylinders. Uh, so a very, very novel form of, uh, of storage. Uh, completely new, uh, based on nothing that anybody had ever developed uh, or proposed before. Uh, so slide rules, uh, just to remind you of what they, uh, and logarithms remind you what they actually look like. They, 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 they have a scale. Uh, the scale gets finer as you go to the right. Uh, and the principal idea, uh, which I won't bother to go through, is that uh, it converts uh, multiplication into, into additions. Uh, so uh, to multiply x times y, you, you add the logarithm of fx to the logarithm of y, and the end result is equal to the logarithm of x times y. Uh, so you might think this is a really ancient uh, uh, technology. In fact, it goes back to uh, Uttarad in 1622, and logarithms themselves go back to, I think, something like 1602 with John Napier. Um, but, but in fact, you can buy slide rules now. The, this, these slide rules are from the uh, Nebraska Corn Board. You can buy them online now. They're for uh, calculating the recommended nitrogen rates for corn. Uh, and another example would be every pilot around the world has to, is mandated to uh, carry a navigation slide rule uh, that they know how to use uh, and have to prove that they know how to use uh, so that uh, they can use that if their navigation equipment fails. So they may not be used uh, as commonly as they were, but they used to be uh, very endemic in, in society. So his machine was again like Babbage's, uh, uh, fully mechanical, uh, but very realizable with the technology of the time. And it was, um, it was small, it was about the size of a bar fridge. Uh, and uh, his design was very, very different from uh, Babbage's as you've seen. He had a mill to do the addition, so that technology goes back to Leibniz, but his index and his storage are, are uh, uh, as far back as 1909 when, when Ludgate himself introduced those concepts. And then his programming and input and output, again, is using Jacquard's technology from 1801. I hope you appreciate that I'm adding a bit of history to this. Um, then. Again, like Babbage, it was never, Babbage's machine, it, Ludgate's machine was never built, and his, his, his drawings have never been found. Um, and we are trying to reimagine his machine, so perhaps we can build it at some time, uh, but it's difficult to say, very difficult to say that it'll ever be able to be built. Uh, in fact, it's, it's proving very difficult to reimagine it uh, at all. Oops. Okay, um, this is a complicated slide. The, the top there is all I'm going to talk about, which is that only a few features of Ludgate's machine are historically traceable back to his, to his, uh, his writings. Uh, the rest of them have to be, have to be deduced by uh, analysis, and very difficult analysis from his papers. You have to figure out the mathematics or the mechanics of something and then say, okay, this particular avenue of thinking can be uh, eliminated uh, or that can and so on until you finally uh, uh, arrive at 
what must be the feature of the machine by a process of elimination. Uh, so I'm sure you, as historians, you would uh, recognize that process very well. Uh, oops. And also, almost everything about construction of the machine is, uh, is unknown. So I'll not go through this either. Um, these slides I will put up this afternoon on the uh, website for the online catalogue of our collection and maybe um, the Ludgate Hub and perhaps Roaring Water Journal or whatever will put a link up uh, later on uh, to, the, to the slides. But the four, four to bottom things say almost everything about program control is unknown. Almost everything else about input and output is unknown. The shape and size of anything is unknown. Uh, and most other details are unknown. So you can see the challenge. <laughs> it's, it's very, very difficult to see how we can build it. Let's just take a look at what uh, Ludgate represents historically. Um, and I, I'm not a historian, so, uh, so I may be, be saying this incorrectly. If we, if we say that the Xs there represent no influence on modern computing, then you can see Ludgate and indeed Babbage had no influence on modern computing. And what I mean by that is there's no record uh, of references in m the literature about modern electronic computers that states that they derived uh, so-and-so a feature from either of those two uh, machines. Um, but in Ludgate's uh, case, this p it because it's such a compact uh, uh, and piece of mechanics, um, there's a possibility that it might be used in nanocomputers, which are based around constructing micro-miniature machines with cogs and wheels and levers, and you can see that, that there is a possible opportunity there. Historically, there's four fathers of computing. Nobody in, in, in computer science would, would deny this. Uh, and uh, 1843, Charles, Charles Babbage, for his for, for not for his machine, but for the, the uh, concept of an analytical engine. Um, and 1854, George Boole, who did his, his work uh, looking out over the River Lee, uh, working for UCC, uh, on, on what's known now as Boolean logic, which underlies all of modern computing. And then in 1936, Alan Turing of the Enigma coding uh, fame, uh, for, for not for the Enigma coding, uh, but or decoding, but for the theory of computing, which was five or so years before uh, the Enigma work. And then in 1937 and 1948, uh, Claude Shannon from Bell Laboratories in the States uh, made two very significant uh, contributions, particularly information theory, which uh, can be applied to physics, you know, the grand unified theories, uh, can be applied to genetics, can be applied to biology. It's a very... Uh, widely um, uh, utilized theory, uh, but of course also relates to multimedia and television and communications and things like that. Um, oops. So Bull and Turing and Shannon, they impact on all, all aspects of modern society. Uh, there's no denying that. Uh, principally because computing now uh, impacts on all aspects of modern society, but Babbage does not. Uh, and nonetheless, he's, he's very notable for having introduced uh, the, the concept of, uh, the f of the first analytical engine. Um, so his, his importance is historical in, in that sense. Um, and the other thing he did was he raised a very controversial subject in those days, which was the, the idea of thinking machines, uh, which is somewhat analogous to the, the debate uh, and controversy that now is taking place over artificial intelligence. Uh, so both Turing and Babbage were very were polymaths, I suppose you would say. So Turing is the father of computing, one of the fathers of computing. He's the person who did uh, the decoding of the Enigma machine. He's the father of morphology in, in, in um, biology. And he's also one of the principal fathers of artificial intelligence. Uh, and Babbage <laughs> is likewise a polymath. Um, 
Coincidentally, there's also four types of analytical machines. There's Babbage's first one, and the second one is, is actually Ludgate's because it, it's so different that it represents almost a completely new type of analytical engine. Uh, and then from 1920 uh, onwards, the electromechanical uh, analytical engines. And from 1949, when the first six, uh, the six first generation uh, uh, electronic computers uh, were, were operational um, uh, to now when there are now billions of, of, um, uh, of analytical engines uh, in all sorts of things running big data, big science, health, business, government, um, and smaller things like uh, domestic appliances and all your mobile phones and even toys. Uh, it's everywhere. I think there's something like seven or eight billion people in the world, but there's many multiples of that uh, uh, of analytical engines, and uh, the, the number is rising sharply uh, with time. So Ludgate's notable for being the second person who introduced a, an analytical engine, and, a, and, a, and a, a greatly different one at that. And he's also in, uh, notable for introducing what, uh, what he called his logarithmic indexes, but they're now known as, as Irish logarithms. Um, and, and also, for the first multiply accumulator, which we can understand from what I put up, and also for, for do, uh, doing division, the first to do division by a convergent series. I won't go into that. Um, and for other very novel uh, concepts in storage and in program. So like, like Babbage, his, his, uh, his importance is historical. It's not for the hardware or for influence on modern machines or whatever. So let's look at his life now, uh, which is what the title of this <laughs> talk was. Uh, his childhood uh, started in uh, 2nd of August 1883 here in Townsend Street in, in Skibreen. Uh, his father was Michael Edward Ludgate, who was an ex-soldier who had been uh, born and raised uh, in, in the townland of Kilshanig, which is about five, mi five kilometers west of, of Mallow. His mother was Mary Ann McMahon. Uh, who was born in Aydin in Sussex, but her, her, her parents were both Irish as well. Um, and we know that the Ludgates were in Scabrine in 1881 when uh, Percy's elder brother uh, Alfred was born, and also in 1883 when Percy was born, but we don't know where they were between 1883 and 1889. There's a gap there, um, and we hope that somebody will come up with uh, uh, information that will tell us more about that. They next appear in Dublin uh, in 1890 at 28 Foster Terrace in Dublin, which no longer exists. It's been, it's been gobbled up by the extension of, of Croke Park. Uh, but the house that we show here is, is I, I think, probably quite representative of it. It's only four doors down, down the street. And the, the, the houses went 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. So I'm almost, almost certain it would have been just a replica of this. Um, uh, and he is listed in Tom's directory in 1890 all the way through to 1898 uh, as, as being at that address. And it includes his uh, sons and his daughter, Augusta. Uh, so clearly the whole family were in this business of teaching shorthand and uh, were living in that particular house. Then we know that uh, from, from school records that uh, Percy went to St. George's Infant School between the ages of seven and eight. Uh, now, there are two St. George's Infant School uh, in the same parish of St. George's in North uh, Dublin. Uh, the, the, the first school is, is behind this, uh, this church, St. George's Church, um, which is right beside Temple Street Children's Hospital. Uh, and, and the rear of it has the, the vestry and the, uh, and the infant school that uh, existed. Uh, and and then the second one is this one in North Strand. Um, and we don't know which, is, which he went to. Um, this photograph on the left, by the way, is notable because it's the first photograph that was ever taken in Ireland by Fox Talbot in, in 1843. Um, the family were, were Episcopalian, which is a branch of the Anglican Church. Um, and, and they went to St. George's, uh, which held two services every day, one for the Anglicans and the, the, the next for the, uh, the Episcopalian community. 
And uh, you can see that in those days, uh, Dublin was a much nicer city to be in. Uh, the, there were none of the was none of the hurly burly of cars taking up the majority of the space. Uh, uh, and in many ways, a lot of people would love to have cars banished from the centre city and uh, the city returned to this kind of uh, relative grace. Um, So he then entered adolescence uh, by going to secondary school, but we do not know where he went. Um, all we know is that his subsequent history was that he, he was so bright that he must have done extremely well and he probably won prizes. Um, and it's surprising he didn't win a scholarship somewhere. Um, uh, so from 1896 to uh, 1898, he would have gone to some school. Um, and and I ha I've, I've got the alumni of various sc uh, schools in the locality in Dublin, uh, searching their records to, f to find out. Uh, the next thing we know is that he left school at age 15 and joined the civil service as what they called a boy copyist. Um, and uh, the next year after that, uh, in 1899, his family moved to 30 Dargle Road, which is shown here. This, this house is very um, misleading. It looks small, but it's actually quite big because it's built on sloping land. So at the back, it's two stories high. Uh, and uh, well, it's not, it's not a grand house, but, but for instance, in the, in the roof there, you see a skylight. The, the, they had 14 foot ceilings, and they were able, the new owners were able to break into that and make a small bedroom for a child uh, upstairs. Uh, so so the, the new owners have actually refurbished it to a very high uh, standard. They've retained as much as possible. The, the door, the door handles, the banisters, the fireplaces are exactly as Percy would have actually um, uh, seen and used. Uh, it's kind of s s surreal to, to turn the handle that Percy Ludgate turned. Um, in 1898, uh, he was appointed a uh, boy copyist, I said. Um, in, in 1899, his father, Michael, ended up in Kilmainham prison. We don't know whether, whether the move to Dargo Road and the, the, and the commitment to prison were related, quite possibly, as we can see. And then in 1900, his brother, Frederick, uh, who he was very fond of, uh, married Alice Walsh. And then in 1901, Frederick and Alice are, sh are shown as being uh, uh, f six doors down the street. Um, his father, Michael, is in Balbriggan. So that's 28 kilometers away. So clearly, there was a family rupture. And it, it's quite possible that this move to Dargle Road uh, was, was part of that rupture. Um, and then Percy is shown as being. Uh, He's still a boy copyist, but he's in the National Education Office, which I'm sure suited his, his intellect. Uh, in March 1903, he sat an exam for the civil service for a more senior post and became the top Irish candidate. Um, so you can see from that he must have excelled in, in classics, which was, uh, which was necessary for... Um, for the civil service in those days, and, and probably maths because of his subsequent uh, writings, which, uh, which display a, a strong knowledge of uh, some quite abstruse uh, aspects of maths. Um, he passed the medical, but he wasn't uh, offered a post. And other people who were further down the pecking order did get offered posts. So the question is, why did that happen? And there's a big mystery about that. Uh, so. One of the things we need to do is try and find uh, civil service records that might tell us why this was the case. Um, and then in um, the same year, August 1903, um, six months later, if you wish, uh, uh, his, his boy copyist post expi expired. So he would have had to leave the civil service uh, at that point. Um, in, in the same year, 1903, he started work on his analytical machine because we know from this, the very start of his, his uh, first paper on it that uh, he said it was uh, the result of six years' work. Um, and we know that he submitted it to the IDS in December 1908. Um, his, his niece has said uh, that he worked uh, until the small hours of, of uh, 
the morning, uh, more or less as, as a hobby on, on his machine. In October of 1904, um, so another year later, he sat another exam and passed again, uh, but in this case he, f he failed the medical, uh, and so uh, that disqualified him from a post in the civil service, who were very hot on their medicals in those days. Um, uh, in February of 1905, so four months afterwards, uh, uh, Timothy Harrington uh, MP actually took uh, the case of Percy Ludgate to the House of Commons and queried why he had not got the post in the first place, why he had uh, uh, been, been excluded from the second post because of, uh, of failing the medical, um, and basically he got a, a, a raspberry, a, a negative um, response. And so clearly that was the end of his civil service career. Uh, and again, as I say, we really need to find these civil service records. They don't exist here in, in Ireland, but you never know. Since it was taken to the House of Commons, they may exist in, uh, in the UK in some summary form that might help us. Um, and the question is too, was there a reason behind this that is nothing to do with medicals and ill health and so on? Uh, and we'll get to that a bit later. So now, at the age of 21, he entered adulthood. And the question is, what did he do once he left the civil service? From the age of 20 onwards, uh, we don't know what he did, but we do know that in 1911, he's in the census as uh, a, a clerk of a corn merchants. Now, in an awful lot of, um, of uh, articles about Percy Ludgate, he's said to be an accountant. But that was years after he presented his paper. Um, so, so he was just the clerk uh, to a corn merchant um, at, at that point in time. Now, corn and potato factors were in mostly around uh, Smithfield in, in, in uh, Dublin. And I know this because my great-grandfather and his father before him had uh, corn and potato factors in, in Little Britain Street, which is shown here. And these buildings were amongst the oldest and most derelict buildings in, in Dublin. Um, there was a big... Uh, Rumpus in 1913 when, when a building around the corner fell down and 200 odd people died. Uh, and the, the bricks were rubbish bricks. There was a special Dublin mortar that was, was designed to hold up these, these very poor standard bricks. Um, and by this age, uh, you, you could probably have put your finger into the, into the bricks. Uh, and I say that because I was once in the basement of a building uh, where I was actually able to do that, right up to my knuckle, without, without any resistance whatsoever. Um, in 1908, he submitted his paper to uh, the RDS, and in 1909, in April, it was uh, published in the scientific proceedings of the Royal Dublin Society. And in July 1909, there was a very positive review uh, published by Professor Charles Vernon Boys in the journal Nature. Uh, so this is a stunning achievement by uh, the clerk to a corn merchant in a very run-down area of Dublin. Um, and it's kind of a little bit, it reminds me of Einstein because Einstein published, he had a nanus mirabilis where he published something like five papers. One of them on pho the photoelectric effect uh, gained him his Nobel Prize. That wasn't even the, the paper that he did on relativity. So, you know, he had a wonderful year, and he was just a, uh, a clerk in a patent office in Switzerland. Uh, so, so you can't you can't say Percy Ludgate is like Einstein, but the the kind of uh, commonality there is is a little striking. In 1914, so five years later, he published uh, in uh, a. Sorry, he presented and it was published uh, in the proceedings uh, at a conference and a, and a uh, exhibition uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, and what he what he published on was mainly focused on uh, on Babbage. And uh, clearly, it was an invited paper, and uh, it was an extraordinary honour because one would have expected that Babbage was very well known. Uh, uh, for his, for his impact at that time, you would have expected that uh, a very senior academic from a professor from London or Edinburgh 
or Manchester or Liverpool, for instance, um, would, have, would have been invited instead. So clearly Ludgate was well respected in mathematical circles at that time because this was actually run by the mathematical uh, uh, side of Edinburgh University. Uh, that, that conference ran from uh, Friday the 24th of July to Monday the 27th of July and it's generally agreed that, uh, you tell me, but I've, I've read this, that World War I started on Tuesday the 28th of July. So, and, and, and even Saturday the 25th of July, um, Russia declared war. Uh, so this was clearly a very tense period. Um, uh, And then during the war, he worked uh, for a war office committee in, in Dublin uh, that was led by a senior partner of uh, a, a notable um, firm of accountants, Kevins and Sons. Um, and this involved uh, planning and organization on a, on a vast scale. Uh, uh, you, got to, you have to remember that, that during World War I, eight million horses died in Flanders. So, Feeding eight million horses must have been quite a challenge. Um, uh, and Ludgate apparently played a big role in this and he was, uh, was um, very much uh, congratulated for that. Then he had a change for the better in his circumstances. He became a mature student and started studying accountancy at the Rathmines College of Commerce. And he did that from 1914 through to 1917. And this is the Rathmines College of Commerce now. It, it occupied then and, and still does now the town hall of, uh, uh, of Rathmines and the buildings uh, behind there, um, the modern buildings now, but they were older in the past. Um, so let's just imagine that we're going home with Percy Ludgate from the Rathmines College of Commerce uh, in those days. Uh, so he would have come down uh, Rathmines Road towards the city probably would have walked because he probably couldn't afford uh, to continually buy tram tickets uh, in, the, in those days. Um, so he would have passed by Patrick Street, which if I was him, I'd have considered look really interesting, but, but also a bit grim. <laughs> so, uh, and, and also I was, I was impressed to find that they actually had ver verandas uh, to keep off the rain in those days. Uh, and I wonder why they don't now. Um, and then he'd have gone up, the street, up Patrick Street towards uh, Christchurch, then about 900 years old, um, and gone around the corner to the right there and down past Dublin Castle and into Dame Street. Um, and so he'd have walked down Dame Street to, to Trinity College at the end, uh, and around past the Bank of Ireland in College Green and, and out towards uh, O'Connell Bridge. Um, and and then from there into Sackville Street, uh, past the Metropole Ho Hotel on the left there, and the GPO, and, uh, and, and Nelson's Column. Uh, and you can see how well provided Dublin was with public transport in, in those days. And that was for a much smaller city than it is now. Uh, so shame on Dublin that they haven't kept up uh, and then up past uh, Parnell Square and uh, what they used to call the new Rotunda Rooms uh, and up into, um, into North Frederick Street. Uh, and then he would have gone around on the right uh, at the top there and into Dorset Street. Um, it's called Dorset Street, not Dorset Street. Um, search me why. But, uh, and then on home to, to Drumcondra uh, to 30 Dargo Road. Um, so in that walk home, and also the walk back the other way, he would have passed all the principal spots of action during the uprising in 1916. Um, so he would have seen the sheer destruction around O'Connell Bridge there and along Eden Quay. Uh, uh, that's quite sobering to think that he walked past all that. Uh, he'd have seen the, the ruin of the GPO and I don't know, you can't really see it. Uh, on the right-hand side there is the ruins of Cleary's, which was completely demolished, uh, and then going up, uh, looking up uh, Sack Sackville Street uh, northwards. 
And then if you looked around the other way, he'd have seen the destruction of the Metropole Hotel there on the, on the far right and all the buildings uh, to the left of, of it. And the general mess that was created uh, after the uprising. Uh, so I'm sure this really did impact on, on his psyche. Um, anyway, at that point, he finished his, yep, finished his um, exams. He got a gold medal in accountancy. He became an accountant, a full professional accountant. Um, and uh, he worked in Kevin's and Sons in this very building here. Um, he's said to have possessed characteristics that are usually associated with genius. This is by one of his colleagues, by the way. Uh, and he was so regarded by his colleagues on the staff. And he was humble, courteous, and patient and popular. Um, he'd have uh, been able to afford a tram. And he'd have got tram number 27, which is shown down here uh, on the left, which is the circular tram that went through uh, from, from Drumcondra to College Green and back again. And in 1919, he'd have seen the Peace Day Parade. You can say with almost certainty, I think, that way up there, somewhere up about there, he'd have either been looking down from the windows of Kevin's uh, and Son's offices, or he'd have been in the crowd, the melee below, looking at the parade itself. Um, uh, his, his niece said he took long, solitary walks. He was gentle and modest, a simple man. He nev she never heard him made a condemning remark about anyone. She thought he was a really good man, highly thought of by anyone who, who knew him which was corroborated by his, one of his colleagues, and always appeared to be thinking deeply. Um, he never married, which is a pity, because if he had, we might know a lot more about him. <laughs> now he had, and the family had, a tragic end. Uh, oops. In, they had a Nanus Horribilis, as Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth once said. Um, in December 1921, his brother Frederick died of TB, which had been a notifiable disease for a good 30 or 40 years by then. Um, and then uh, in October, he went to, on holiday to Lucerne. He came back, he contracted pneumonia, and, uh, and he died aged 39, uh, being nursed by Frederick's wife, Alice, who died six days later, which does tend to suggest a very, very vir virulent um, infection. Oops. I'm really sorry about this. By 1953, his parents and his siblings had died, and those living in Dublin had all been buried in the same grave. Percy actually paid for the grave. Um, and it, uh, by 1987, his only niece, Violet, died. Uh, whoops. And this is the grave. Uh, it's owned by his... Uh, is the, the brother that survived the longest until 1953, Alfred, who made no will. Um, Percy had bequeathed the grave to him. Uh, so it, according to the laws, uh, it can only be marked by descendants, but there are no descendants. So this is very unsatisfactory for such a notable person to be in a, an unmarked grave. Um, and at that point, whoops, I think I'll just skip through these. This is what the... the the original house that most of the Ludgates in Ireland and the, the wide dis diaspora of Ludgates that are in America descend from. The, this is, uh, despite uh, appearances, it's the original uh, 18th century house from, from the early 1700s, uh, all except for the portico there with the pillars. Uh, uh, it's in very good condition. It has four foot thick walls. Um, and, uh, and from that point on, I think I'll skip forward. You can see the generations of the family there. They lived all in a locality. Um, the, the, the farmhouse you saw is at, at Marble Hill up here. Uh, that's the next generation lived down here. Um, and then uh, the third generation lived here in this smaller farm. And that's where Percy's uh, father was born and raised. And, and Percy's father would have known all three farms. And it's quite possible that Percy would have been brought on, on feast holidays like Christmas and Easter uh, to this area, to his, his grandparents' house, and would have known those three farms as well. 
I won't go through that. Now, we, we have actually made a, an interesting recent discovery. Until 2018, till Christmas last year, it was thought that there, that there were no other descendants, that the family had died out. But then in, uh, then in December, I discovered there's a, a descendant um, in America. Uh, and it turns out that Percy's only niece, uh, Violet, gave birth to a daughter, Barbara, in 1935. And uh, Barbara was then privately adopted and, and renamed, which uh, obviously made it ha her hard to find. Uh, and she was brought up overseas. Um, and then, uh, and for privacy reasons, I won't say uh, where, uh, but, but uh, she then moved to America and then gave birth to and raised six children. And then uh, they had uh, children. So she has now seven grandchildren. And they have children. So she now has six great-grandchildren. So, so the Ludgate family has blossomed from none to, to quite a few, as you can see, in the space of the last six months. And it has been quite a roller coaster ride going through all of that, because we have um, been engaged in DNA matching uh, from that descendant uh, to try and trace other uh, family lines. And we have actually succeeded in a number of cases. But the principal outcome of this very happy result is that uh, the, the grandchildren uh, are direct descendants of Frederick and Alice uh, Ludgate. Frederick, remember, is Percy's brother. Alice was his sister-in-law. And also direct descendants of Frederick's mother, which is Percy's mother as well. So their direct descendants, they are allowed to mark the grave. So the process of marking the grave is now underway, uh, being handled by the, by the, the grandchildren. Um, so at that, on that happy note, I'll, I'll call this talk to an end. Uh, just want to thank the, the team of people that have been helping me in this, um, and also to acknowledge uh, the other contributors, particularly Canon Ethne Lynch in in, uh, in Mallow, who's been very generous with her time. So, so Adrian, would you like to come up now? What we want to do now is, is make a public appeal for information uh, about Percy Ludgate. Oops, if we can get this to come up. So this is a joint public call for information uh, from anywhere where you may find it. Uh, between myself, uh, representing Trinity College, and Adrian Harrington here, representing the Ludgate Hub here in Scabreen. So we, we're looking for information uh, about relatives, uh, about acquaintances, for documents, photos, memories, and particularly drawings. Um, and the smallest thing can often be um, very helpful in, in uncovering something. And that really did happen in the case of uh, discovering this descendant. It was just a small little thing that opened, uh, like open sesame, uh, the Pandora's box of all of that. Um, so as I say, the smallest snippet can, be, uh, can often be a key. At the bottom here, um, I've given the, the link to uh, the online catalog of our, um, of our collection. Uh, and I will put uh, this uh, presentation on, on, that, um, on that online catalog uh, sometime later today. OK, would you like okay. to say any words? That's great. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, I met Brian first about two years ago now at this stage, and I've just really been struck by the labor of love that has almost taken, I won't say taken over your life, but taken over a lot of your time at this stage. So on my behalf and on behalf of the board of the Ludgate Hub, I just want to thank you very much for this, because this would not have happened without you, and we wouldn't have any of this information. So thank you very much from all of us. Yeah.